Ooh. Hello, welcome back everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. G. We are working on the PS 101 Astronomy, Introduction to Astronomy class at St. Anselm College. Uh, Summer Online Week 2, Part 2, uh, Magnitudes and Distances. If you are working along at home with this class, uh, you will be doing Reading 4, or the links associated with that, and Worksheet 4. Um, which is all about magnitudes and distances and why they are important. Um, starting with magnitudes, uh, which is a way of measuring and communicating brightness. Uh, if you take a look somewhere out in the universe, this specific somewhere is a, a globular cluster slash, we'll just stick with globular cluster, globular cluster, um, cluster of stars uh, in our galaxy, the Milky Way. Uh, this is a picture made with the Hubble Space Telescope of this cluster, and you see lots and lots of stars. And you see stars of different brightnesses. You see stars of different colors. Um, so there's a lot going on here that we can start to understand about stars based on what we see in their images. Um, starting off with uh, a concept known as luminosity. Uh, the brightness of a star, how bright it appears to us, depends on two things. Its distance from us, that seems pretty obvious, uh, and its luminosity. Its luminosity, or absolute brightness, is how much power a star radiates. So energy per second, is, uh, watts, is, is an example of a unit we use to measure power. So that's how much energy is given off as light by some source, like our star. The apparent brightness is how much of that starlight reaches Earth. This diagram is showing uh, a light source, a spherical light source going in all directions. And in, you can pick one particular patch of area, some distance from that star, and use that to measure how much light is coming through. Now, the further away you get from that star, the bigger that patch from that little angle is. So the same amount of light is spread out over a larger area. That is the reason why things look dimmer the further away you get from them. So um, luminosity or absolute brightness versus apparent brightness. Um, this is the saying that lumin luminosity passes through these patches of area in a sphere. Um, you can divide the luminosity by the area to get that brightness that you get at some given location far away. The magnitude scale is a scale that uh, has been used uh, and is still used to communicate the brightness of objects in the sky. So it was started um, as a scale just from one to five, about one to five, one to six, um, where the brightest stars were put in magnitude one, and the second brightest stars were put in magnitude two, and the third and three, and et cetera, et cetera, down to the faintest stars, which would be put in bin five or six. Now, if you notice, if you change that into a number line, um, kind of makes things look a bit backwards. Bigger numbers, larger numbers, means dimmer objects. Smaller numbers means brighter objects. And because there are objects brighter than the stars that we can see in the night sky, at least with apparent brightness, you can have negative magnitude numbers. Don't want you to worry about the math. If you're doing the reading, we're not going to worry about converting brightness um, to magnitude. But I want you to understand that bigger numbers on this scale mean dimmer objects, and smaller, less, or smaller or more negative numbers mean brightness. And it, like I said, it's it's a historical reason for how stars were first categorized by brightness. We got this somewhat backwards, somewhat wonky number scale. Um, of course, those numbers may not mean anything until you attach it to things that you are uh, used to. So, for example, um, one of the brightest, the, one of the brightest stars in the sky, 
Vega, which if you're Northern Hemisphere summer right now, um, it is pretty high in the sky all night. Um, that is a magnitude zero. That's a pretty bright star. The brightest star in the nighttime sky, I think that's correct, is Sirius, um, which probably can't see too well this time of year um, in the Northern Hemisphere. That's at a brightness of negative one. But there are things in the night sky, or not night sky, that are brighter than that. Venus, when it's at its brightest, negative five, that's a pretty bright thing. This is the kind of like Venus that people call in as a UFO sighting. Full moon, you're probably aware of how bright that is. You've probably seen a full moon before. Negative 13, the sun, negative 27. Um, these numbers, uh, as you may notice or may not notice, these are not linear. The sun is not just 27 times brighter than, say, Vega. The difference between each magnitude is 2.5 time, 2 times brighter. So Sirius is 2.5 times brighter than Vega. Vega is two magnitudes away from Polaris. That means Vega is five times brighter than Polaris. Again, we're not, I'm not going to make you do that math, but something to think about. This is not a linear scale. These things start getting very bright or very dim very quickly. Um, Polaris, North Star, if you get a chance to see this for your observing lab, um, it's a magnitude two um, from a city area, it doesn't appear that bright. Um, you can see it, but it's not that bright. Naked eye limit, that is if you're in a place with almost no light pollution or no light pollution, meaning no street lights, no car lights, no building lights, you're in the middle of the desert, in the middle of the ocean, um, and if you have a good scene, you should, you should be able to see things as dim as six. With binoculars, you're making your eyeballs bigger, sort of, or you're taking in more light. You can start to see fainter objects with, a, with a, um, binoculars with a six inch telescope. That might be around the size of the telescope you might use for your observing lab if you get to visit a, um, a star party. Pluto, uh, outside of that range, it's, it's super faint. Um, eight meter, so eight meter wide mirrors make some of the biggest telescopes on the ground. Can see down to, again, this is 27 magnitudes away from zero from Vega. So it's, Vega is as bright compared to these things as the sun is to Vega, if that helps. And the Hubble Space Telescope can go even further. So when you see these numbers, these ranges of numbers, um, I want you to have, have a feel for what a magnitude zero thing is versus a magnitude, say, five or six. We do distinguish between apparent magnitude and absolute magnitude, just as absolute brightness or luminosity is how much light a star is giving off. Um, absolute magnitude is how bright the star really is, which is a little hard to, to figure, so we'll start with the easy one, which is apparent magnitude. How bright the star appears to be to us here on planet Earth. So for example, um, got this little diagram um, by another astronomy educator, Patrick Len, uh, where the size of the square is gives you an idea of how bright something is. So here's the bright, bright, bright sun, negative 27. Little m is its apparent magnitude. Here's a star called Deneb. It's a little fainter than uh, Vega, also up high in northern hemisphere summer. Um, its magnitude is plus one. So visible, fairly bright. To convert between apparent magnitude and absolute magnitude, you have to find the distance to the thing you're measuring. So distance to the sun, distance to, to Deneb, and then pretend to either pull it in closer or push it further away so it's at a standard distance. So absolute magnitude is a way of saying, if all of these objects were a standard distance away, this is how bright they would appear to us. Because if they're all the same distance, Right? Then we can compare the brightness of these different objects intrinsically. Which one's really brighter than the other? You can only tell when they're at the same distance. That distance is 10 parsecs. I will get into a parsec later in this uh, little lecture. But if you moved the sun far away to 10 parsecs and brought Deneb in closer, because it's much further than 10 parsecs away, what you find is the sun would have a magnitude of plus 5. That's close to the naked eye limit. 
Uh, you couldn't... Pr I, personally, cannot see a magnitude 5 star in the skies over Manchester, New Hampshire. Um, it would just not be visible. Uh, whereas Deneb, Deneb is a much brighter star intrinsically. If it was brought to the distance of 10 parsecs, it would be a brightness of negative 8. So even brighter than Venus at its brightest. Um, so you... That's the at 10 parsecs brightness. So what you do when you look at magnitudes, um, if you want to know how bright or dim something is, that's really useful for when you're going out observing. Sun's super bright. These stars are pretty bright. This star is pretty faint. Um, but if you want to know physically what are these objects like, you need to know their distance so that you could figure out their absolute magnitude. Once you know their absolute magnitude, then you can start to say, oh, the sun's actually not that bright of a star. Uh, Vega is still kind of bright of a star. This star is even fainter uh, than we thought it was. So the highlights for magnitudes, uh, you want to know that absolute brightness or luminosity is how much light an object gives off. Apparent brightness is how bright that object appears to an observer on Earth because of the distance. The magnitude system runs backwards. Bright objects have low numbers and by low i mean they can go really negative and dim objects have high numbers uh and finally the absolute magnitude is the brightness at a standard distance of 10 parsecs so what is a parsec uh that's our next topic here uh a parsec is not a unit of time um a lot has been said okay geek time a lot has been said <laughs> about a famous little line from the original Star Wars uh, where Han Solo brags about having done the Kessel Run in 12 parsecs. Which, when you're talking about racing, you're like, oh, I did that 5K in... I, I can't run for anything. I did that 5K in half an hour. 20 minutes. I don't even know what's reasonable because it takes me like an hour. Um... <laughs> takes me an hour when I'm having a bad knee day to do a 5k. Um, yeah, you get a sense of how fast or slow someone is because they've given you a standard of distance and the time it takes to do it. So when he said, I did the Kessel Run in 12 parsecs, sounds like I did a distance in this time. But parsec, despite sounding like seconds, is not a unit of distance, uh, sorry, it's not a unit of time, it's a unit of distance. Minor spoiler alert for Han Solo, the movie that was just recently out. Uh, this is, again, in summer 2018. Uh, there's a lot of plot manipulation to be like, we really knew Parsec was a unit of distance. Okay, buddy. Anyway, minor spoiler. Here's what a Parsec really is. Unit of distance. It is uh, The word Parsec is based on two different words. Parallax and arc second. Start with arc second, since I think we've touched on that in a previous video, um, when we talked about angular measurements. So we can't, we measure the distances of things in our sky using angles. Uh, your index finger at arm's length is, the width of your index finger at arm's length is a degree, one degree. Full circle makes 360 of those. One degree can be split up into 60 arc minutes and each of those 60 arc minutes can be broken up into 60 arc seconds. So teeny, teeny, tiny angle. Or, as this lovely illustration shows, it's the size of a, uh, since I think the World Cup's still going on? Um, men's World Cup. Uh, size of a soccer ball or football, if you are not in the United States. Uh, the size of a soccer ball that is 45 kilometers or 28 miles away. So take a moment to imagine soccer ball 28 miles away. That's how big an arc second is. It's a tiny, tiny, tiny little, little, little angle on the sky. All right, so it's a tiny little angle on the sky. What is parallax? Parallax is uh, the way an object shifts based on your viewpoint and how far it is away from you. So you can do this all by yourself while you're watching this video. Um, I do this in class and I make everybody put their fingers up. You put your finger up and you close one eye. I hope you can see this in the frame. And you cover something small far away from you. So usually when I'm teaching in class, there's like a clock on the wall or something like that. 
and you cover that with your finger. Now hold your finger in place and switch which eye is open and which is closed. Your finger is no longer covering that object. Your finger looks like it's moving compared to the distant background object. This is being shown here. Here's the viewpoint. Here's the eyes, two different eyes, <laughs> different parts of your face. Here's your finger, the object. Here's some distant background object. Close this eye, look through viewpoint A. Your finger looks like it's in front of the blue square. Uh, switch eyes, your finger looks like it's in front of the red square. Here's what it looks like from each eye. So it looks like that yellow object is moving back and forth based on your viewpoint. Now, if you can measure how far that star moves in your field of view as an angular measurement, you can, and you know the distance between your two viewpoints, like your two eyes, you can get the distance to your finger. It is a really silly way of getting the distance to your finger. However, it's a really useful way of getting the distance to stars. So here's what it looks like for a star. Here's the sun. Here's the earth going around the sun. As we go around the sun, we get different viewpoints. We're in different places, like the two eyes on your face you have a sort of nearby star and a whole bunch of background stars. So some distance, the further away you go, the less parallax there is, and you get to a point where you have distant stars that don't appear to move at all when we go around the sun. So when we're here in our orbit, we take a picture of that star, look at that line of sight, it looks like it's over here. When we're on the other side of the orbit, take a picture of that star, it looks like it's over here in the image um, among the, the um, background stars. So you're going round and round. That star actually looks like, over the course of a year, it's going round and round or back and forth um, across that image. You can measure that angle on the image, because you know what angle in the sky that is. Half of that is the parallax angle. So that's a teeny tiny little angle that you measure there. So the highlights for this, for parallax, uh, I haven't even, I haven't quite gotten to what a parsec is yet, but that'll be in the next section, promise. Uh, parallax is the apparent movement of an object due to a change in perspective. Stellar parallax is measured when the Earth is on different sides of its orbit around the sun. If you're playing along with the worksheets, um, you will be doing the uh, worksheet called the parsec, where you will be recreating um, that diagram and seeing how parallax works. So how do we get a distance from that uh, when we actually measure that parallax? So parallax is the angle. Distance is the thing we're really looking for. And we have a super, 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 super very simple equation. I promise you, super simple, right here. D, the distance in parsecs. This is that unit we're now defining is one over P, the parallax angle in arc seconds. So if you do this parallax method for a star and you find that its parallax is one arc second, which means it's moved two arc seconds over the course of your, your year that you've observed it, its parallax is one arc second, one over one, its distance is one parsec. Again, what's important here is the fact that as the parallax angle goes up, so the star moves more, distance goes down. So the closer a star is, the more of a parallax angle there is. If you do that finger thing, I want you to play with different distances to prove to yourself that that's correct. As P, the angle gets smaller, then the distance is further away. Eventually you get to a point where the distance is so far away that with our best telescopes, P is too small to measure. Now you're probably more familiar with a unit of dis distance called a light year. It's the length of uh, distance that light travels in one year. It's close to a parsec, uh, 3.26 times the distance in parsecs gives you the distance in light years. We like to use light years as a unit of distance when talking to the general public because it's an easier concept to grasp. If we had to sit here and explain parallax every time we want to tell the distance to somebody, I think, I think everyone would, would hate us. Um, but parsec is a more natural unit of measurement 
for how we measure the distances to stars. So again, showing that diagram, um, we've got the angle P. It's half the angle that the star has moved over the full time. Right, so one over that P gives you the distance. Now, something you want to think about, how often should you make parallax measurements for a particular star? Again, if you're playing along with the worksheets at home, you will uh, get to see that. Um, if you're not careful, if you're measuring the parallax for some star anywhere in the sky, you might want to measure it for the full year and make sure you get the full range of its motion. Uh, however, astronomers who uh, did parallax measurements um, in the early yeah, in the early 20th century uh, were pretty clever about what they did. If the sun was here, right, they would look out uh, straight up in the sky just as the sun was setting or rising and pick the stars that were in that direction. So they would only have to do it every six months. But it's a little tricky and it's a little fun uh, exercise to think about how often you have to do that to make sure you get the whole motion. Uh, highlights here. Parsec is a unit of distance. Parsec is a unit of distance. Parsec is a unit of distance, not of time. <laughs> it's directly connected to the measurement method of stellar parallax. So that's the basic method that astronomers use or have used to determine the distances to stars near us uh, in the galaxy. So now you can see where we're going with this. We can measure the apparent brightness of a star and we can measure its distance. Put those together, we can find out its absolute brightness or its luminosity, how bright the star really is. Once you know how bright the star really is, you can start talking about the physics of what makes a star do what it does, give off light, do all these things. We'll get more into light uh, next time, next week. See you on the discussion boards.